This conference, this conference will now be recorded. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today for our presentation on lymphedema from diagnosis to treatment. My name is Jennifer Wang, the president of Paradigm Medical. We are a national medical products distributor specializing in lymphedema, post mastectomy, breast care, and orthopedic footwear and foot care products. Um, Dr. Alvarez, if you could just subscribe to the uh, next slide. Uh, you'll be able to find our contact information there. Um, we are the exclusive Canadian distributor of biocompression systems, a Health Canada approved line of pneumatic compression pumps. We've been servicing all of Canada for over 25 years and we are headquartered in Toronto, Ontario. I'm very, very honored to be introducing Dr. Alvarez, our speaker here today. He is joining us from New Jersey. Dr. Alvarez is the program director of the Vascular and Wound Care Center, the director of clinical research at the University Hospital, and professor in the Department of Surgery at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. Over the last 40 years, Dr. Alvarez has been a pioneering force in wound care and the treatment of lymphedema. He is a founding editor of the journals Wounds and the managing editor of ePlasty. He has authored over 100 peer-reviewed publications relating to wound care and has been the principal investigator in more than 50 major clinical trials. What impresses me most about Dr. Alvarez, not only is he a very, very busy man, um, he is also very compassionate. Many long-suffering patients have given up hope on healing, but Dr. Alvarez restores their faith by dispensing good humor, compassion, and practical medical advice. I would personally like to thank Dr. Alvarez for his time and his energy here today. He is in the epicenter of the pandemic in the U.S., um, so not only does he have his usual busy schedule, but he has some added commitments. So we're very, very grateful to have you here today. Um, a couple of little housekeeping things before I pass it over to Dr. Alvarez. If everyone can please just mute their devices, this will help minimize any background noises. And if you can just turn off your cameras, um, that will help save um, any network and bandwidth issues. Uh, we'll be saving all questions until the end of the presentation, um, at which point feel free to unmute your device when you have a question, or there's also a chat option. Um, which you can find to the top right hand corner of your screen. There's a little dialog box and you can just type in your questions and we will address them at that time. Um, so with that, I would like to hand it over to Dr. Alvarez. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. And thanks for that very kind introduction. Um, uh, I appreciate that very much. Um, for my disclosures, if it was baseball season, I would tell you that my only disclosure here would be that I am a Yankee fan. But um, in regards to business, I do uh, participate in the advisory board with biocompression, which is the um, lymphedema uh, pneumatic compression pump that I'm going to feature uh, through the talk. And it's really the only one we've ever worked with here. And um, I'll be sharing some research uh, with that uh, involving uh, intermittent pneumatic compression. Uh, lymphedema is a progressive and mutually unrelentingly, unrelenting back variably painful swelling of the limbs. It can include genitalia and the torso. It results from the lymphatic system insufficiency and deranged lymphatic transport, usually by obstruction. At the physical level, lymphedema is characterized by swelling of the tissues and eventual induration or thickening or hardening of the skin and soft tissue. At the microvascular level, you're likely to see these lakes that I'm showing you here associated with accumulated lymph um, and the lack of its transport through the system. Uh, as you can see here, as it progresses, you get thickening of the wall of the lymph, uh, which in increases the, re the release of cytokines and inflammatory mediators that subsequently call an inflammatory process. And that inflammatory process leads to fibrosis or scarring. At the fibrosis level, uh, lymphedema is quite advanced. And um, 
often uh, very difficult to deal with. Uh, and in these patients, obviously, it's something that uh, is dramatically uh, uh, powerful for them, and especially when they don't receive the proper treatment and they don't see improvement. Uh, it really changes their personality very drastically. Primary lymphedema, or we refer to it as congenital lymphedema, uh, uh, is shown here. Uh, Milroy's, of course, uh, presents at birth. Uh, Precox or um, Milgren's uh, presents at puberty or before 30, and lymphedema tarda presents after 30 years. This is the lymphedema that occurs in one or two percent of the population. It, it's not your prevalent lymphedema. The prevalent lymphedema that we see now, especially with the influx of obesity, is secondary or acquired lymphedema. The most common is phlebolymphedema and is caused by uncontrolled uh, chronic uh, venous insufficiency. Uh, there's also lymphedema caused by post-inflammatory dermatitis or lymphangitis following uh, episodes of uh, systemic infection or cellulitis. And then there's post-surgical uh, lymphedema that uh, is obviously affected in patients that have uh, lymph node resection or cancer surgery and, uh, and radiation damage. And then there's post-traumatic and certain accidents, especially crush injury. And uh, the most prevalent worldwide is parasitic or filariasis, which uh, I've seen quite a bit of uh, through my research here um, uh, with lymphedema. Secondary lymphedema is an awful uh, problem that uh, really is um, very life constricting. Uh, it's inadequate lymphatic drainage, and it's mostly due nowadays, uh, if you look at the statistics, to obesity. And uh, uh, you get obesity, and it's combined with untreated chronic venous insufficiency, and these patients develop uh, this flibo lymphedema uh, that is uh, really damaging. Uh, it can develop immediately or postoperatively or after chronic venous insufficiency or the onset of obesity, uh, but it, you, it can come later in life as well. And uh, one of the most common uh, misconceptions is that lymphedema uh, and phlebo lymphedema associated with chronic venous insufficiency, not cancer, is the predominant cause of lower extremity lymphedema. Um, and uh, it, uh, the clinical characteristics include female patients more so in distribution, not only in secondary lymphedema, but um, associated to CVI or chronic venous insufficiency, but also females are more prevalent uh, because of cancer and breast cancer and upper extremity lymphedema. The prevalence in the United States compared to Canada is about a tenth. Uh, the United States is 10 million patients are affected. Uh, again, like I mentioned, obesity is the most common cause. Um, 10 to 40 percent of cancer patients, more like 15, but uh, you know, statistics are not really clear. Uh, and the most common cause, like I said, is uh, chronic venous insufficiency. Um, in Canada, again, obesity is the most prevalent cause. 15% is cancer-related, and the statistics are very similar uh, to that in the United States, but smaller in number. You have to remember that this is a growing, um, I don't want to call it an epidemic, but it's a growing problem. We see more and more of it each day. And these patients are prejudiced. Uh, the doctors really don't want to see them because it's hard to treat them. Um, resource utilization is huge. Uh, it takes a long time to see a lymphedema patient. Uh, at our clinic, which we see quite a few, in, in never less than an hour uh, before you have a very successful lymphedema visit. Uh, and that's at the short end. So, uh, you know, most doctors said, you know, they don't, can't do it. It's very difficult for them to rely on a lymphedema practice. So these patients for a long, long time remain um, untreated and they remain quiet and uh, they really don't say very much until their disease gets so progressive um, that it's damaging. Like I mentioned before, primary, primary lymphedema affects women twice uh, more often than men. And uh, worldwide it's filariasis or the filaria um, that's carried by a mosquito, which, which goes ahead, it's a parasite that grows and finds a home in the lymph and changes your lymph um, progress and the pro progression of uh, lymph movement uh, through obstruction. 
The diagnostic features of lymphedema, uh, and it's classically uh, seen very, very easily and very quickly, are these stemmer signs, these deep wrinkles and creases, uh, the square toe or the shovel toe, uh, where you actually nail becomes like a shovel. Uh, your toes won't stent because they're swollen, they're domed, and they get hardened with fibrotic changes. Uh, there's papillomatosis or warts that exist in the skin. Uh, and this is a terribly debilitating problem. It occurs at stage three and four lymphedema. Uh, and this is because the lymph doesn't move and lymph, uh, when it doesn't move, carries bacteria and houses bacteria as well as viruses. And papilloma being a very prevalent virus uh, is seen very, very frequently in these patients. They often develop uh, blisters or bullae um, that become open and then an ulcer develops. Uh, stasis dermatitis is very frequent with a type of rash that develops in the lower leg. Uh, and these patients, um, after the rash develops, they become sensitive to a lot of different contact agents. And that becomes more difficult for them because now um, topical agents, many of them have parabens as preservatives and they become um, uh, allergic uh, or uh, contact damage by these topical agents. They can develop ulcerations and their ulcers will heal more slowly because there's less flow, not only at the venous end, but also at the lymphatic end. Uh, a very common uh, differential diagnosis is lipedema, which is also growing. Uh, lipedema occurs almost always in women. It's nearly exclusive to women. It does affect men, but um, only those that are taking hormones or in some type of therapy. It doesn't affect men at all. Uh, it's symmetrical swelling, but their swelling is soft. You feel that lymphedema tissue and it's, it's soft tissue. If you look at the feet and you isolate the feet at all, by itself, you'll realize that the feet are totally normal in lipedema, where the feet are very affected in lymphedema. Um, and you'll get no warty involvement in lipedema where you do in lymphedema and you get papillomatosis or verruca papillomata. Uh, I mentioned it was nearly exclusive to women. And again, it's symmetrical in lipedema, not necessarily symmetrical in lymphedema. And this is important because the treatment is totally different uh, for the two. If lymphedema remains untreated, uh, it becomes a very difficult problem and much, much more costly. Um, as the tissue channels in the lymph uh, increase in size and number because of the swelling, uh, it reduces the transport of oxygen and other nutrients through the skin. Uh, obviously, it interferes with healing and could create venous ulceration. So it becomes a culture medium, like I mentioned, for both viruses and bacteria. And uh, hardening or fibrosis occurs with prolonged inf inflammation. Uh, you'll get this thickening of the skin and hardening of the tissue. Uh, and then at this point, um, even um, the common treatments that we know affect it and help it don't anymore. Uh, the stages are the latency stage, which really is subclinical and very difficult to, to, to note uh, at any area, I mean, almost impossible to diagnose. Uh, at the mild stage, it's very hard still, but there's some accumulation of fluid. The patient will say, my legs are feeling a little heavier than normal. Uh, it will subside with elevation um, and then not necessarily any pitting. When you press down, you won't see uh, a little depression that remains uh, very much. So uh, in stage one, it's still very mild, not very easily identifiable clinically. At stage two, uh, limb elevation alone rarely reduces it. Yeah, you start seeing a little hardening or fibrosis and you'll start seeing some color changes and, uh, and some development of hemosiderin in the lower leg associated not only with inflammation, but also from leaking vessels that leak out uh, uh, hemoglobin and the uh, heme gets deposited in the skin, causing staining of the skin right in the gator part of the leg, the lower leg from the mid calf down to the ankle. At stage three, uh, it becomes really deforming, uh, very hard to treat. Um, very, it takes a while to see results at stage three and four, and I'm going to get into that to some degree. And uh, you'll begin to see uh, a lot of fat deposits, a lot of these deeper wrinkles, and uh, shoes don't fit anymore, and uh, things become very uncomfortable for these folks. 
Uh, the biggest problem I find is not really the lymphedema and the treating it because you can do it and if the patient confines himself to doing it, they do it. And uh, I've had the um, experience of working with a lot of lymphedema patients um, throughout research trials. Now, research trials are different than regular clinical trials or clinical visits because you get to know the patient. Uh, we have these patients uh, in trials for a year and two years, and they become your family. You really get to know them really well. And uh, these folks uh, really are affected. They, they lose hope or disheartened, and they, they become defeated. And it's different from depression because demoralization can be corrected. And the minute they see improvement, uh, you start seeing the women wear makeup again, and you start seeing um, the people taking care of themselves and feeling much more um, aware. So it's not a depression that they're in, it's a demoralization that they're in, that it is, it is correctable, which is a wonderful thing about it. There are many treatment options. Um, obviously, I say many because there are obviously choices, uh, but uh, only a couple that really uh, do work, and I'm going to get to that. Uh, although now there's some, some uh, development in, in surgical resection and microsurgical um, surgery for some patients with sp particular limb problems, uh, but really medical treatment is uh, the way to go. Uh, and um, you, you can be very successful with manual limb drainage and complete decongestive therapy, which involves this very soft type of massage. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, pneumatic compression therapy or intermittent pneumatic compression, the names are interchangeable, are, are used uh, very, very common in these patients and uh, very successfully if you really follow particular principles. Uh, with both of these, people don't often understand that exercise is crucial, not just important, it's crucial. So you really need to do a combination. If the best would be all three. Uh, if you can possibly do it, um, but sometimes insurance restrictions don't allow you to have that. Uh, the goals of treatment are, are the following. And this is the order of uh, my order, and every every uh, person who cares for lymphedema patient has a different type of an order, but these are our patient presentation. If, if I can get rid of your pain and your odor and, and control the amount of fluid that's coming out of your leg, uh, I know that I'll get your confidence. And right after that, I can do a lot more things. Once you become confident, compliance increases. And when compliance uh, and confidence increase, you'll see that these patients really stay with the regimen that you provide them. And they really have successful results. So you want to get to the goals early on and, and obtainable. Uh, for example, weight loss and decreasing limb size are low on my list because they're not easily obtainable goals. Their goals that come later, but they are important, uh, but they're not the goal that I'm going to tell my patient to really concentrate on. If they concentrate on limb size, they're going to be demoralized at first, and it takes quite a while. So pain, wound healing, I want to soften the tissue, make it feel softer again. I want to prevent infection, and especially hospitalization. These patients are hospitalized a lot for cellulitis. They have huge problems. I want to decrease your limb size and, of course, uh, your function and quality of life and weight loss uh, is, uh, is last but not least on the list. So manual or decongestive uh, physiotherapy uh, actually was developed in Europe and involves a, a, a soft massage that stimulates muscle contraction and therefore the peristaltic movement of lymph. Uh, it has to be and followed by multi-layer compression bandaging with short stretch bandaging. And it must, if, if you don't do that, then the limp just returns. So it, it is a combination and therefore tedious. Uh, it becomes, a, and not only do the fingers need to be bandaged all the way up uh, the limb. It's daily therapy uh, followed by short stretch comp compression and exercises are crucially important. When you have fibrotic limbs, when the skin begins, gets hardened, it's harder with manual lymph drainage and, and CDP and CDT. It doesn't work as well. It still works, but not nearly as well uh, once you reach the very advanced stages. Pneumatic compression therapy has been used since the 50s. And um, I, you know, I, to me, it is an absolute necessity for a lymphedema patient even at stage two to begin um, intermittent pneumatic compression. Uh, I want it to be a, a way of life for them, just like you would 
uh, shower once a day. Um, I would want these patients to use uh, or apply therapy with intermittent pneumatic compression twice a day, not once, but twice. Uh, it's a multiple chambered, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's a pump or a sleeve that inflates with a pump and there's sections of it that squeeze. So there'll be an area that squeezes first at the foot, then at the ankle, then at the calf, then at the upper calf. So it's a gradient uh, compression and uh, uh, it's uh, upward in, in flow. So as the diagram on the lower left shows you, it actually moves the lymph upward. Uh, most most particular chambers and pumps that I we use are four or eight chamber, and I'll get into the difference in the pumps in, the, in a little while. I like to use it with compression. I, I we tell our patients we provide them with compression bandages or a compression garment if they don't have a wound, um, and then we like to go ahead and have intermittent pneumatic therapy above the bandage, uh, not removing the bandage. Uh, you have to remember that the best results are achieved between 6 and 12 weeks after therapy, and sometimes longer depending on uh, the actual severity of lymphatic disease. So you, you, you better tell them right away it's, it's a three-month ordeal. Um, and if you do it really steadily for eight weeks, I'll show you some parameters that will change that will make you confident that you're going to get better in 12 People don't realize that there's quite a bit of evidence associated with intermittent chromatic compression, and it is supported by every guideline associated with not only um, venous disease, but also with lymphedema. So there's no real reason why anybody has should have any doubt uh, as to the safety and efficacy of lymphedema, uh, of uh, intermittent pneumatic compression for the treatment of lymphedema. Uh, there are many different pumps available. I'm going to try to cover as many as I can uh, and what we know about them. Uh, th this is the effect of, this, these are studies that we've published. So this is the effect of intermittent pneumatic compression on limb size, uh, that leg circumference. And you can see after eight weeks of, uh, the picture below, after eight weeks of compression plus intermittent pneumatic compression. So it's compression with a short stretch bandage, then uh, the the pump is applied on top as a therapy. And in eight weeks, there's your difference. You can see pretty good differences in the, in the, the actual table above uh, will show you that. Uh, at baseline at week 20, uh, when you use uh, intermittent pneumatic compression plus short stretch bandaging, you get about a 15 to 20% decrease in um, your limb size or your circumference. Uh, when you do compression alone, you get uh, about a 10% decrease. So the pump gives you a lot uh, better results uh, in time. Uh, if you don't use a pump, you, you need to use, uh, I mean, if you don't use bandages, you'll need to use the intermittent pneumatic compression device longer. Uh, and it, the picture on the right shows you after 16 weeks of intermittent pneumatic compression. So I, I tell you a little story. When I um, I was asked by uh, MedCAC, which is the uh, governing board for reimbursement here in the United States, uh, run by Medicare and Medicaid, CMS. And uh, I was asked to be a panelist at one of these uh, lymphedema uh, events. And um, a lot of the other panelists and, and people didn't realize that intermittent pneumatic compression was effective. And they were all looking at all of these research findings and say, oh, the research is uh, equivocal and it's not so forth and so on, so on. And everybody was sort of incredulous. And, and I, you know, they asked me about it and I said, look, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm a pragmatic, I'm a regular person. I'm not, I don't, I can tell you right now that all of you out there don't need any reference articles uh, of knowing that if you jump off an airplane, you better have a parachute to survive. Uh, I don't need to show you an article in that regard. But look at these before and after images. Um, how much proof do you need? Um, let me tell you something, uh, after that alone, you know, these people realize that you, you don't have to have proof for everything. We sometimes get crazy about having all these uh, articles to prove everything is working perfectly in multi-center trials with class A evidence. You know, most of medicine has class level C evidence. Uh, even, even blood pressure studies have level C evidence. And yet uh, we scrutinize this particular technology that can help these patients uh, so readily. Uh, and, and often the insurance refuses to reimburse them, which is to me amazing. I write a letter with pictures and let me tell you something, they all get reimbursed. 
The very first sign of improvement after intermittent pneumatic compression is softening of the tissues. And you can notice it as little as three weeks to a month. And this is why we do durometer measurements. So this is called a durometer or a tonometer uh, measuring, and it measures the, the, the actual softness of the tissue. Uh, so we'll take, um, for example, this is from Seleska and others, but we've published similar results. When you take uh, the reading of, of how soft your skin is to begin with, and in a month I can show you, and even with your finger you can feel it, that the difference is huge. It's a big difference uh, uh, in softness. Now I got you. I got your attention because I now I've told you that what I mentioned to you initially when you stayed with it, it worked. And, and now your confidence is becoming better and better. So this is a really important test that I tell everybody to do uh, on your patients because it really shows them that, that this is working. When um, intermittent pneumatic compression is combined with manual lymphatic drainage or uh, complete decongestive therapy, it's even better. Uh, it really improves it dramatically. And if, you know, if, uh, if the patient um, had the ability to pay uh, for all of this and didn't w worry about insurance, I tell them to do both uh, because this is what works the best, a combination of um, MLD or uh, congest, uh, complete decongestive therapy with IPC. And this is a, a, uh, this is a magnificent study by Suba. Uh, and Roxen uh, published in 2002, showing clearly that um, there is a very significant difference when you combine the two. Um, I'm gonna sh share with you some um, findings that we've had uh, in our patient cohort with looking at uh, intermittent pneumatic compression. I'm gonna show you what we do. And my expectation of showing you what we do is that if you did what I did, uh, I would expect you to get the same results. And I, I, I guarantee that. So I like to share my results because I know that maybe that's what you'll follow because I know that that'll work. In this particular trial that I'm gonna share with you are patients with secondary lymphedema that not only are advanced, but had very, very difficult to heal venous ulcers. So we actually uh, limited inclusion into wounds that were uh, very difficult to heal. We call them BOWs, big old wounds. They're big, they're old in history, they're longer than a year and they're large in size. And th this is very demoralizing because they take so long, so long to heal. And all of these have failed healing with compression alone. All of these patients are, have secondary lymphedema, every single one of them. This is a 52 patient cohort uh, in this trial. And uh, th this is the median time to ulcer, ulcer closure or wound healing. Um, and you can see it, it took 200 days to heal these patients. Uh, uh, if, you, if you use intermittent pneumatic compression, you can heal them in 145 days, uh, as opposed to just compression alone. Um, that's a huge difference of being heal, healing free all those days. Uh, and this is uh, combining both intermittent pneumatic compression uh, with regular static compression or bandaging. Um, Pain is, is crucially important, and uh, this particular uh, device, intermittent pneumatic compression, is terrific for symptom relief, palliation. It, um, it even totally eliminates uh, restless leg syndrome. Uh, it's really amazing what the body reacts to when it has uh, physical stimuli uh, like, like this, and squeezing in a sequential segmental fashion is, is very instrumental to moving not only venous blood, but also lymph. Uh, and this is the pain differences at, at just week one, two, and three uh, from study start. Now, that alone to me is a, a very big finding uh, and something that you should all keep in mind that if it's painful. Uh, and the pain they feel is, uh, and this is an important point to make, the pain they feel would be this. If you ask them to define their pain, they'll say to you, you know, Doc, my leg feels heavy. It's just really heavy, like, like maybe the leg can't fit in its skin anymore. And it's like a fitting, the, the coat's too tight. And then that's a pain, believe it or not, that's a pain. Uh, they feel that type of pain and they also feel burning pain. And the burning pain they feel are, is more later in the day when their venous pressures are higher. Uh, and when you put them in a, when you lay them down completely in the decubitus position uh, and they're, heart is level with their feet, 
this pain goes away after 20 minutes. Well, the pump does the same thing. It actually eliminates or, or decreases your venous pressure and reduces your pain um, dramatically. Now, how it works is that it moves lymph. Uh, people even doubted that for a while. And uh, these are studies that were published back in 2017, but there's many studies. This is a uh, patients uh, that were injected with uh, ICG green, which is intocyanide. It's a very uh, uh, help. It's not a harmful type of dye that moves in the lymph. And this is a subcutaneous injection it goes into the blood end of the lymph. And you can see here, uh, before um, pneumatic compression therapy, after pneumatic compression therapy. And you not only see the ventral the medial bundles being filled in the leg, uh, but also extravascularly. So you actually see this tissue being moved, uh, not only through the tissue, but you get better perfusion. Uh, and that's why you get the better healing. The, the actual blood perfuses better through that hardened fibrotic tissue. Uh, so this is how it works. This is the mechanism, mechanism of action. Uh, this slide shows that what we're finding now, if you look at uh, probably in the future, um, we're finding that, that you can fine tune intermittent pneumatic compression therapy to patients. So, so those that have more fibrosis really need to get squeezed a little harder. Uh, and this is a study by Olszewski and his group in, uh, in, in Warsaw, Poland, uh, which is a terrific lymph, uh, uh, lymphedema research group. And what they show here, in this slide is if you compress the leg at pressures with intermittent pneumatic compression at 50, 80, and 120, which is the x-axis, um, and in patients that have lymphedema, so these are all secondary lymphedema, and patients that don't have lymphedema in both the calf and the thigh, uh, you can see that the greater the pressure, the more the movement of that lymph, and this is through lymph scintigraphy, uh, these measurements. And at the thigh, it's good to know that at the thigh in patients affected with lymphedema, that movement is not so much because of the width of the thigh and the actual circumference is so great. So the amount of counter compression is inversely related to the radius of the curve. That is the law of Laplace. So that means that if you have a very big leg, your compression is not nearly as effective as if it was a smaller leg. So the patients that are most at risk of being overcompressed are those with little legs, not those with big legs. The big legs, you can rest easy. You can give them your cell phone number. They're never going to call you. But the ones with little legs, those are the ones you're going to have problems with. So this is really important to remember uh, in all of these patients. Uh, and I, we adjust our pressures. I, I like starting at 50 uh, millimeters of mercury when I'm using compression pumps. Uh, this is also work from Olszewski's group, and this is uh, lift scintigraphy studies before and after intermittent pneumatic compression at six months and eight months. Now, no, look at the bot. You know what six months is, right? We just, uh, we've been in this pandemic since March 1 here in New Jersey. That's three months. All right, I got three more months to tell my lymphedema patient to be, to be patient. Three more months. All right, so six months is a long time, but that's when you really see differences. And here you can see lymph channels. Now, once you have lymph channels, that's a development of new healthy lymph that can help you move that tissue fluid along. And uh, remember that it takes a while, it's not immediate. But look at these results. I mean, you know, you don't need a lot to show you evidence like this. This is uh, six and eight months, what it does. And I just, this is just a close up of these tissue channels. Is, uh, uh, as they develop with this form of exercise, because that's what this is, is a compression of, this, uh, of the legs. Now, all of our patients in every one of our research studies have to, has to do exercise. Uh, and we keep a diary with it and we, we program them. So uh, like I mentioned before, you have to be rigorous. It's got to be the, the treatment that the therapy with the intermittent pneumatic compression plus exercise, not, not, not or, but plus, plus exercise. If you if you talk to a lymphedema patient, the biggest problem is their weight, um, because they know that's the cause. Um, and you know, almost every one of them. And and uh, are they bothered by it? Yes, they're bothered by it. It's a dramatic problem for them. Um, and this is a, of course a dilemma. But you can see here in this graph, uh, and they can't enjoy the things they do once they get heavy. Not only are they discriminated upon. I mean. You talk about discrimination, it's awful in, in, in 
folks that are obese. Um, and it becomes very, very difficult for them to get just about any kind of medical service. Uh, this is a study that we did um, and published in 2014. It involved 98 patients, um, and there were two different clinical uh, sites in this one. Uh, ourselves, um, this is when I was in the Bronx, New York, and, and it involved a, a group from uh, down in Florida and Boca Raton area in South Florida. And uh, we combined our data, and what we, we can share with you here is that it's a terrific palliative approach uh, to taking care of these patients. And these are just symptom changes in their symptoms. Uh, for example, pain. Uh, after 12 weeks, there's a, a dramatic difference, a statistically significant difference of pain relief. Uh, the amount of edema is also statistically significantly different in a 12-week period. And most of all, inflammation is reduced dramatically. So these patients, not only their pain is reduced, but also all of the fibrosis associated with, with uh, that particular inflammatory condition have become better. Um, this is work that's recently published by um, Sapan Desai and his group in, in Chicago. And this is a, a graph showing the results of uh, the quality of life form. The surveys, short form 36, which is a validated form that's used a lot in, um, in healthcare. And it measures uh, all of these parameters associated with your quality of your life. And it involves the baseline when patients first started without using intermittent pneumatic compression at three months and then after a year. The orange line is three months and the gray line is, is a year. And every one of these particular parameters, except for um, the measurement of emotional distress, um, is affected in these patients uh, significantly different and improved with intermittent pneumatic compression. Uh, and this is a significantly different to the P001 uh, level. So it's a high significance um, in effectiveness uh, and your quality of your life. So uh, patients alone where our goals aren't necessarily healing, uh, they do very well uh, with these devices for palliation. These are advantages of uh, IPC therapy and uh, only a few, of, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you one, these are ones again that are important to me. Uh, patients can use it at home. Uh, and this particular device is, is phenomenally durable and um, they can, it can be used by anyone at home. Now, there are some issues that I'm gonna tell you about, about teaching patients how to use it um, and being very careful how it's done correctly because um, you know a lot of times patients don't necessarily know how to uh, put on these garments properly, but I'm going to mention that and get into it a little bit. It, it reduces edema uh, and, and improves fibrosis, softens that tissue. Uh, obviously, if you have the ability to have both a minimal manual lymphatic drainage or, com or complete decongestive therapy, it improves those results when you treat with intermittent pneumatic compression. It reduces the progression of lymphedema, which is really great, and you can keep them at a particular stage um, and keep them there. Obviously, it improves healing, it reduces pain. Uh, prolonged use uh, reduces the recurrence of ulceration, the development of new wounds. Uh, it's great for the prevention of thrombosis or DVT, uh, relieves restless, re restless leg syndrome, and this study is, fun is fantastic. It actually uh, eliminates it. And it is covered by most uh, private insurance and some provincial healthcare plans for you guys in Canada. Um, th this is um, uh, what I want to just share with you uh, with uh, findings associated with uh, the intermittent pneumatic compression for the treatment of anyone with venous ulcers. And every one of the studies that have been published as summarized here, um, they all have faster healing. Every single one of the studies, there's no, it's, it's unequivocally effective uh, and, uh, and thereby a very important element. And you can see here the therapies are uh, either in the, for example, in the McCullough study, that's twice weekly. In, um, in the Mulder study is three hours twice a day. Um, so they vary. Uh, this one, the Penamaki is the uh, 45 minute once a day. The Coleridge is four hours once a day. Ours, and this is what we always do, is one hour twice a day. Um, and that's what I recommend because that's what works in, uh, in my hands and I know that it'll work for you. Um, there are several IPC devices available to you and uh, of course Paradigm and, and Jennifer will get into cover that a little, a little bit more. 
precisely. But what I wanted to mention to you uh, about these pumps is that they're different. Uh, I basically use and love the 2004. And I've never seen real differences between the 2004 or the four chamber and the eight chamber. Although there are patients that prefer the eight chamber and I'll get into that uh, in a minute. Uh, but this is a four chamber pump uh, and each of the cycle um, changes are about 18 seconds per cycle. So 18 seconds, it squeezes at the foot and then it eliminates and stops the foot squeeze and goes to um, goes approximately to the lower calf or to the ankle and then the upper calf, uh, 18 seconds each time. Um, the, the eight or the 2008 or 3008, the 2008 eight chamber gradient sequential and that's for about six and a half seconds each time that you get squeezed and you get squeezed along an eight chamber system. Uh, so that's very effective as well. Uh, the 3008 is the future of pumps in which you can actually program each one of these little chambers. Um, and you can also, if a patient has pain because of a wound, you can also reduce the, the squeeze in that particular chamber. Uh, it also has an automatic sh shut off and it has a compliance monitor, which I really like. So it tells you how much you really have used it. Um, and uh, I believe biocompression is the only system um, available in Canada. Garments are really crucial and the type of garment you use are, are absolutely instrumental. And uh, I can just tell you that uh, uh, getting the right garment makes, the makes all the difference and being it fitted properly. One wonderful thing about it is that if it's fitted by uh, the folks at Paradigm, I, mean, I know it's going to get done correctly. We want our patients, even after they get the pump from our particular vendor or um, distributor, we want them to bring it in the first time so that we can really be sure it fits right. Um, and if it fits right, then we teach them what to do and how to do it. Uh, not only are there lots of sleeves available in different sizes, they, Bio makes the best custom size garments there are. Um, it's really phenomenal. And the, the people at Bio are really great people. I've been working with them since 2001. Um, and even when patients can't afford um, uh, through their insurance, uh, I get bio to, they go ahead and help me every time and provide it for these patients uh, um, and in, a, in a charitable way. And so it's, they're, they're just terrific to work with. The indications and the contraindications are important. And a lot of people, you know, go ahead and use it and they, they encounter a problem and it's because they really haven't done their homework. Uh, if you suspect, deep venous thrombosis, you got to do a duplex. I, all my patients with lower leg involvement and ulceration, I just do a duplex to rule out DVT. Uh, such an easy study and it's covered by all insurances uh, and a very important thing. And you can sleep nice and easy after that. You don't have to worry. Now, we have a lot of patients with DVT where the DVT is old and established and we still pump them. So you really want the, you know, the active or new DVT and you want to diagnose that because you don't want to move any clot. Um, for congestive heart failure patients, if patients have trouble breathing and they have a class, uh, New York State class three or four congestive heart failure, I'm careful. I will compress one leg at a time even. Uh, but, but you want to find out how much is this going to affect their ability to, to be breathless. So it's really important to monitor that. The third most important thing is any kind of mass. Um, a lot of times patients go ahead and use these pumps and they, they get genital edema, but they they never ruled out that their patient had a pelvic mass or an abdominal mass. These patients can develop a malignant or non-malignant tumors that, that obstruct the lymph. And unless you do a CT scan to rule out mass, you won't know that. And that's a very important and easy test to do. And, and you know you're not going to have any problems with obstruction uh, proximally as you squeeze their legs. Um, if they have active cancer, um, but not skin cancer, I am careful to use it uh, and basically want to uh, talk to their primary doctor or to their oncologist about the type of cancer uh, because, you know, we're, do we're moving fluid. Um, all of these uh, devices move fluid very effectively. Pulmonary emboli and thrombophlebitis. Acute inflammation of the skin or cellulitis. It's just painful if you use it then. Um, uncontrolled cardiac failure, pulmonary edema, and ischemic vascular disease. So if your patients have arterial disease, you don't want to squeeze their veins. 
uh, frequently asked questions, and uh, there are lots of them, and I'm going to open this up for questions and answers, but these are the ones I'm um, asked more frequently. Can you use the pump over bandages? And the answer is yes, we recommend it, actually, or any garment uh, we recommend it. Um, can the pump uh, be used on patients with mixed disease? And uh, yes, we, we do, but you want to be able to rule out peripheral vascular disease that doesn't involve uh, any critical limb ischemia or anything associated with uh, uh, any kind of arterial blood blockage because this can affect that. Uh, can IPC be used in patients with established DVTs? Yes, they can. Uh, as long as the DVT is old, yes. Uh, can intermittent pneumatic compression be used on patients with congestive heart failure? Like I mentioned before, yes, especially if they're not severe. Um, and you just want to monitor and keep an eye on that as much as you can. Uh, for palliation, we use it a ton. We, we're very big on using it for symptom management. Uh, remember, palliative care is not end of life, right? Uh, that's palliative care is symptom management. Even a little, little boy that breaks their arm needs more palliative care while his bone's healing. Uh, and palliation is, is in, must be a part of your practice no matter how, how you practice. Um, what are the signs that my uh, pump is working properly? Like I mentioned before, the softness of the tissue. Uh, that you'll notice at one month. How should I wash the sleeve? Uh, we like soap and water, just plain soap and water with a mild soap uh, and then, um, you know, rinse it carefully. Uh, that's all that you really need. The only time we've ever had any one of these pumps break down in a patient has been in a, had a patient in the Bronx who brought the pump, said, my pump's not working. I said, bring it in. Let me see what happens. We set the pump up and it turns out that, that a mouse or a rat had chewed on the hosing. Um, <laughs> and that was the only time we've ever had one of these pumps break. I've had drops uh, from the you know dressers, and they never break. They're just really incredible uh, devices. I, I don't know why, but they're <laughs> very durable. Um, what should I do? Sit down or lay down when I apply therapy? Uh, we prefer lying down. Uh, remember that when you're uh, decubitus and your heart is level with your feet, uh, your venous pressure is zero. Um, this is the best flow of your venous blood is when there's no gravity against it. Um, but it works fine in a chair too, which is not, not as effective. And my insurance company will not approve it. What do I do? Uh, I tell you what I do. I immediately write a letter of necessity showing them the facts and, and showing them a before and after picture and include some evidence. And then most of all, show them the, the picture of the patient and how demoralized they are. And I tell them that it's absolutely necessary medically. And I have never had one, uh, one company say no. Um, this is one of our lymphedema patients healed and um, much improved. And you can see they're wearing their stockings now, doing a little exercise. I don't know if I'd recommend the hula hoop here, but um, they're happy. And uh, that's my email if uh, you guys need to uh, reach out for me or any questions. And of course, thank you to our sponsors, Paradigm Medical and uh, Jennifer Wang for um, her assistance, and um, I look forward to answering your, your questions. Thank you, Dr. Alvarez. Alvarez. Wonderful. Um, so we do have a few questions. So we have one from Linda, um, and her question is, was CDT applied daily for eight weeks uh, with pneumatic, comp uh, pneumatic compression uh, pump, um, and was it on weekends too as well? I think she's referring to um, the study in um, in the previous few slides. You mean the SUBA study? Is that the SUBA study where they both I were used? In, where IPC and CDT were used jointly? Um, I believe so. If if that's the case, um, no weekends are always involved. <laughs> You know, you don't, you don't take off on weekend. No, no, no. We, we do a weekends also. And um, uh, the in the in the super study, it, it was eight weeks. We we like at least twelve to sixteen weeks. Um, you know, we, the problem in studies is that it's really hard. You know, they cost a lot of money to see these patients for a long time. And uh, sponsors and grants usually don't uh, you know have limitations as to how long you can treat them. Uh, we tell patients that 12 weeks is a minimum before they see any real results, and 16 weeks is a must, a must. 
Okay, so it was a combination of both CDT and the pneumatic compression pump. Yeah, it'll work faster and better if you do both. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, each patient's different. Uh, you can't really have a cookie cutter portfolio in that regard. You just have to monitor your patient. Again, the, the first thing you'll see is the fibrosis or the tissue hardness. It'll be in duration of the tissue will become less and less. Um, and then it, if you measure lymph girth and, and circumference, that would be a really good measurement as well as having your patients just answer a few very easy quality of life questions as they um, go through the therapy. Great, thank you. Um, we also have a question from Anna Towers. Um, what about combining bandaging with exercise such as slow walking? Won't that do the same as IPC physiologically? No. no. No way. Um, you know, exercise is a combination of things and you have to do it. You have to do the compression management. You have to do the exercise. But in patients with fibrotic disease, um, that alone is just not going to do it uh, at all. You, you really need to sequentially compress these folks. Um, and, you know, in our study, we used short stretch bandaging uh, for 20 weeks. And then uh, the other group was short stretch bandaging plus compression. And both had exercise. These, in this particular study, it was treadmill exercising and also uh, lymphedema exercising involving uh, elevation of the knee and thigh and rocking of the leg. And uh, you saw the differences. It's dramatic. Um, it's a it's a very big plus to have the pump. You you will get res good results with compression alone, but not as fast and not nearly as effective. Uh, so we have another similar on the similar lines, um, a comment from Maurice. Um, IPC treatment is rarely used in our university lymphedema clinic, where six to eight lymphedema patients are seen in our clinic. Exercise is combined with proper compression is much more effective than any pump. Even walking in water chest deep will be more effective than the IPC pump with a minimum of 80 to 90 um, millimeters of mercury of compression at the foot from this simple form of activity. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I, I'll, I'll offer your patients that they can do what you're doing plus, plus, not in a, not against. You, you, you go ahead and compress them and exercise them. We'll add the pump to that and we'll, I guarantee you better results. Guarantee it. Now, you can't use one instead of the other. That's not, that's not the point here. The point is that compression bandaging and intermittent pneumatic compression are adjunct treatments. They work better with each other. Their, their, their symmetry is important. Uh, you know, if a, a patient that can't afford a pub, they come here in the, to our clinic and, and they have good compression bandaging and exercising, yes, they, they can get they're better. But I, I ask them, do you want to get better faster? It's available to you. Why not use it? But, I mean, I'm for the patient. I, I know what I would want. I know what I want for my mother um, and my sister, and that's what I would want. Um, so, Maurice, if you have any other questions, feel free to contact us at Paradigm Medical if you'd like to um, uh, get a demonstration or, or to do a little test on your end. Um, we'd be happy to, uh, to work with you on that. Um, so, another question from Brenda. Is it possible to have a machine for rental or does it have to be per patient only and what about the sleeves? Um, Brenda, please contact us at Paradigm Medical. Our contact information is on the slide here. Um, we will refer you to a local dealer depending on where you live and we'll be able to, uh, to help you answer that question. Ben, can you please post the previous slide uh, with Dr. Alvarez's email? Um, so we'll have that available for you. Um, uh, we'll send out um, uh, the slides um, in uh, a separate email um, after the presentation. Uh, Dana, uh, we find it difficult to get a proper script with the appropriate compression levels. Is there a prescription form for the biopub that we can get? Yeah, so, you know, it is a prescription a product, and what I can tell you is that 
Um, I, li I like to start at 50 millimeters of mercury, 50 to 60 is what I would recommend to start with. Um, you know, in, in the 12 chambered lymphedema trials, uh, as little as 40 has worked. Um, less than 40 uh, only works well with tissue that is not fibrotic. Um, again, I mentioned that the, ex the extent of the lymphedema, remember all these patients that I showed you were all advanced cases. Um, there are cases where the fibrosis hasn't set in, like in stage two or early stage three, where, you know, compression at 30 to 40 helps them. Um, but when you have fibrosis, you really, you need to do, uh, um, you know, I like 50. Um, that's, that's my go-to. Uh, and I like twice a day. So that, you know, you need to have, have a prescription. And remember that to rule out those things that I mentioned, so you don't you don't have any trouble. You know, a lot of patients say that uh, you go ahead and use pumping and and you'll get genital edema. You don't. You, you don't at all. That's that's not right. It, you may not have diagnosed a patient with ascites or with uh, another uh, medical condition like a mass or a lymphatic obstruction elsewhere. Um, but you know, you need to do a couple of small tests to be sure that um, you can go ahead and sequentially compress these folks. Uh, we have Dana. If you have any other questions about that, we do have a um, uh, sort of a, a guideline sheet that we could provide you to as well, with some recommendations on the level of compression, if that is sufficient. Uh, but don't hesitate to give us a call, and, and we can help you with um, with um, finding the uh, the appropriate um, documentation you need. Um, another question from Stephanie. I tried the pump for one month on both legs. It softens the skin tissue, but didn't last long, even after I was wearing compression stocking. I also had headaches and heart racing when trying the pump. All right, so your compression stockings don't fit. Um, that's your number one problem. And I, I have that problem all the time. Uh, listen, it's so hard to get compression stockings to fit. And remember that after four months, they wear out. Um, that, that's all they last. We've published studies that four months compression stockings are not any good anymore. When they get easy to put them on, they're no good anymore. That's the problem. Uh, you, once once you, you go ahead and pump, you need to have adequate compression garment uh, and one that fits in. If you have custom compression garments, they, they don't always fit right. Uh, and that to me, I, I, I practically guarantee you that that's your problem. Um, and then what was the other problem she was having? I forgot. Uh, she's having headaches and heart racing when trying the pump. Uh, that's very, I've never, that's very, very unusual. Um, very unusual. Is she potentially <laughs> laying? Um, never, never heard in, in, in all my uh, 37 years of, of doing this. And no, I've never had that uh, adverse event. Mm. Is she could she be in the wrong position, like sitting in the wrong position, not laying flat, or if she's on a? I don't, you know, I don't know. You know, headaches. You know, it could, headaches. Are, I mean, is it a migraine type headache? It's it's very hard to. It, I can't see how that leads to any headaches uh, at all, um, and uh, increased uh, pulse uh, pulse rate. I don't know why. And uh, I mean, uh, does this person have congestive heart failure or? Have any trouble breathing? Mm -hmm. I guess Stephanie, if you could clarify that we can we can help you address that issue. Yeah, um, we can move. I'd be you know if you if you uh, be ha be happy to address well, anything else. We, I we, know. Have, we have uh, uh, hi Stephanie. You know, physicians here. Yes. Go ahead. Yes, Stephanie. Okay. Yeah. So I'm. Um, I'm I'm 45 year old. I'm I'm I'm, I'm healthy. I'm, I'm very athletic and all that. So I don't have any heart issue or um, migraine. Uh, so I have secondary leg lymphedema related to a gynecolo gynecological cancer. And I was sitting when I was trying the palm. I was doing uh, doing it every day. And I was like I think I was like at 50 or 60 as uh, it was recommended by. Uh, do, you do you have fibrosis? What? What? Do you have fibrosis, thickening of the skin, induration? Yes, yes, yes. 
Yeah, that's why that's why I wanted to to try the pump because with the compression stockings, I like uh, I'm not able to get rid of the fibrotic tissue. All right. So do you do you have a leg sleeve that's calf calf length or whole length sleeve? I I do plenty. I, I have plenty holes for my compression uh, stocking. No, but the sleeve that you use on the pump is it half a leg? It was it, it was the pants. The pants all the way up to the top. Uh, to the the thigh. Yes, and all, is your lymphedema basically on the thigh or involves the entire leg? The fibrotic tissue is uh, the knee and the thigh, but I I have still lymphedema like you know in the ankle and the calf, but it's it's softer, it's fitting, but at the knee and the the the, the thigh it's more fibrotic. Okay, and how how long do you pump? How long do you do the pneumatic therapy for? When I was trying it, I was doing it every day for about an hour, something like that, every night. One hour every night? Yeah, and it, like, you know, right after the treatment, I could see like the fibrotic tissue was like, it, you know, it had really softened, like it, it was working. But right after the treatment, like it didn't take too long that it was filling up, uh, even if I was wearing my mm -hmm. compression side. So so and, and I have custom flat knit. So, you know, it, it could be associated with medications that you're taking. So, do you take your medications in the morning? No, no medication. <laughs> no, you don't take any medications at all? No. Nope. Okay. So, you're just putting this on and all of a sudden you feel like you have a headache and you have, uh, your pulse goes up. Yeah, yeah. So, that's why, like, I did, I tried to do some, some research to see if there was a common side effect but I didn't find mm -hmm. anything so I, that's why I was uh, wondering if it was something yes. you had experienced can, in your practice. I can I can certainly share this with um, a couple of my colleagues and, and see if they've seen anything like that. I, um, In our experience we have not um, so I you know I really can't help you but I, I promise to, uh, to to find out more. Let me find out more about that. And Perfect. Stephanie which uh, what's the brand of the pump that you're using? I had the, the 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 third machine, like the 3008, that okay. I had the borrow from the Certicare here in Ottawa. Okay, great. Okay, so, you have the so well done. And, and that you have all, all eight chambers are working, and you you, you have the Velcro closure or the zippered closure. Uh, I didn't I didn't understand. Sorry. So on the on the sleeve, is it a Velcro closure? Oh, I don't remember. Like it's it's been like I tried maybe about two years ago, something like that. Okay. It must it be was a zipper like, closure. It must be a zipper closure. That's the only one. And the full pan. So have um, you tried it? Have you tried it recently? Does it happen now? You said two years ago. I mean Yeah, know, like yeah, like yeah, I like yeah, I borrow it for like maybe a year or two years ago. I don't remember. But then you know, with the having the headaches and the heart racing and you know, like not so, like, so listen. I, just for just for curiosity, why don't you try it for 15 minutes now? And see if you have the same problem. Oh, I don't have the pump anymore with me. Oh. I, I had <laughs> okay. it before. I had Boro it to see if it was working right. for me or not. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, okay, so um, Julie, next question. Stephanie, don't um, feel free to contact us at Paradigm Medical, and we'll follow up with you if we uh, we get any other feedback back from uh, Dr. Alvarez and his colleagues. Uh, so, Julie, next question: What kind of mask are you talking about in the abdominal? What mask? Cancer. Mass. M A S S. Yes. Yeah. So what happens is that lots of lots of patients that have uh, any kind of lymphatic obstruction, their lymphatic obstruction can be caused by a mass, by you know either a, um, a malignant or a benign tumor. Okay. If you so do a, Catholic... a pelvic CT scan or abdominal scan, will rule that out. Okay. If, if, if you're in a pump and you haven't had a CT scan, you should. It's a very easy, uh, affordable test um, that it's a must. Because then you, you, you don't have to worry about how, you know, how to squeeze these patients. Good 
Great. Uh, so Kathleen had a question uh, regarding compression garments. Um, if compression garments are only good for four months, why do some companies guarantee compression for six months? I'd love to read the evidence on four yeah, months so longevity. I'll send, I'll send you the evidence. Um, the, let me tell you, compression garments vary dramatically by vendor. Uh, so the manufacturing of these garments is five or six manufacturers are really, really, really good. Um, Jobst, Medi, Juzo, I'm naming them off the cuff, but uh, there are many non-brands that are not nearly as good uh, as some of the ones that, um, that I mentioned before. Uh, but but there, that is really an important element. Now, depending on how you don't it, how you put it on, if you use a doning device rather than your hands, there are several doning devices, it makes the stockings last longer. Uh, but in our studies, we've never seen the stocking. There is now. For some reason, four months is, is critical. And at that point, they all start losing their ability to squeeze, uh, especially in concave areas. I wouldn't have bought from the main. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. You asking me a question? No, I'm not sure if they might have been talking okay. to somebody else. Um, so, yeah, so a question. It, yeah, I was just going to say that it, it really has to do with the quality of the stocking and how you don't it, how you put it on. Uh, so another question from Linda. Uh, my understanding is that it's important to include the abdominal abdomen when uh, using IPC on the leg to prevent abdominal edema. Is this correct? No, you, we, we've never, I mean, in, our, in our patients, we don't use the abdominal device. Now, that's usually used for some cancer patients um, that have obstruction in particular different different areas of their of their body. But, um, you know, I don't use the, the torso uh, garment at all. We use just um, extremity garments. Is this, is, I, I wonder if Linda's mentioning the pant. Um, yeah, you're talking, yeah, I don't know if that's the pant. The pant's a garment. It's a, 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 yeah, a, I think a she's referring to the pant as opposed to just, um, you know, a, an abdominal. Okay, well, um, yeah, let, yeah, let me know about that. But the, yeah, the pant is, is, is actually a, a, what we call the full leg sleeve. Yeah, it sounds like she's referring to either the pant or the vest. Yeah. Um, okay. In in that when she says include the abdomen. Yeah. So the pant obviously it goes all the way up to the thigh, um, to the groin area, and and that that is the best one. Uh, we find that compliance is hugely affected by the size of the garment. The bigger the garment, the less that it is used, and uh, that is absolute God's honest truth. The smaller the garment, the easier it is to use it, um, and the more it's complied with. Um, you know, putting on these garments is not an easy thing to do for a lot of these patients. So you have to take that into consideration. I'd rather you use one that you're going to use than one that you're not. Okay, so Nadine had a question. Uh, can this slide presentation be sent to us by email for us to review? Yes. So Nadine, I will follow up um, this uh, presentation and we'll send out the slides. And we're also currently recording the presentation too as well. So we'll uh, send out a recording too in case yeah, so uh, there was anything you missed. I wanted, I'd like to add something to that. Uh, Jennifer, uh, I don't want my slides copied um, without proper um, uh, no, uh, you know, addressing where they come from. Okay, absolutely. We'll, we'll just be sending out a handout form if that's all right. Yes, that's better. Yes, as long as they, you know, they, they go ahead and get teach with my slide. I have no problem with teaching, uh, but I don't want them used for promotional without them, um, you know, deciding where they come from, where they're sourced. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Any other questions? Um, please use this opportunity while we have Dr. Alvarez on the line.
I guess I had a question. So, Dr. Alvarez, have you ever heard, um, we do hear from time to time, um, there's concerns about IPC and causing fibrosis. Say that again? Um, the use of IPC causing yeah. fibrosis. Yes, no. No, it reduces fibrosis. Uh, now, um, you know, if the sleeve doesn't fit properly, um, you can get obstruction and more fibrosis. For example, let's say the sleeve doesn't fit the leg entirely, and you go ahead, I've, I've seen this happen to many patients, where they go ahead and put it on and um, the sleeve doesn't fit at the very top, let's say at the thigh. So they go ahead and zipper it like halfway or three quarters of the way, and they go ahead and begin to pump. Well, that's just gonna create uh, obstruction because the whole purpose of this is to move the lymph in a uniform fashion. So it's, this is why I mentioned that, uh, you know, fitting the sleeve is, is really as important as using it. Um, and uh, you, you really need to be sure that the sleeve, sleeve fits just right uh, and it's applied right. Uh, but no, it doesn't cause fibrosis. Absolutely. And to add to that, um, at Paradigm, we provide, like, training is super critical, um, as Dr. Alvarez mentioned. Um, so we do provide a certificate training program on the pneumatic compression pump, where we do provide detail um, um, on how to properly fit the garment and how to pr properly select the right garment for um, the patient. So if you're interested in that, whether it be a dealer or um, a therapist, um, feel free to give us a call um, at Paradigm Medical and we'll sign you up for the next training session. All right, so going once, going twice. <laughs> um, if there's no other questions, um, I would like to thank everyone for being on the call here today. I think it's a super important topic for all of us to be educating ourselves on um, so that we can provide the best care for um, patients who um, who live with this condition. And once again, thank you, Dr. Alvarez, for taking the time here today. Um, if there's any other follow-up questions after the webinar, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at Paradigm Medical. All the contact information is um, available on the slide here. Um, we will also follow up um, uh, with an email to everyone with some of the studies and um, some of the additional details that uh, we, we spoke to on this, uh, on this webinar. And with that, um, thank you everyone. Uh, be safe, be safe and, and take good care of yourselves. Thank you.